Hello, hello. Welcome to the Wetland Arrivals webinar. And um, as this is a Zoom webinar, we you won't be able to turn on your video or your microphone, but you will be able to ask us questions using the Q&A box, which you can find at the bottom of your screen. We have time allocated for questions and answers at the end of the session, maybe some halfway through if we felt like it. Um, but if we don't get to all your questions today, we will try and answer them after the webinar and share them after the event. The presentations in this session are being recorded. There's no chat function enabled for this event. If you have any technical questions, there is someone from the events team with us today who may be able to help, although for some, some Zoom related issues, we may not be able to offer any support. So we are here to talk about birds arriving in wetlands, exotic looking birds. Now, if you get the RSPB magazine, or indeed, if you've been out and about birding in the past few years, you'll know that we are seeing growing numbers of mainly long-legged, exotic looking wetland birds appearing in the UK. Now, normally to see birds like glossy ibis, black winged stilt, or black crowned night heron, you'd have to travel to continental Europe. But now here they are in UK wetlands. Why is this happening? Luke Phillips will be telling us all about the birds and where they've been popping up. Hi, Luke. Hello. And Katie Monk will be taking a look at the climate crisis. Hello, Katie. Hiya. Now, finally, at the end, we have a little video of an interview with the urban birder, David Lindo, who's been seeing some of these changes exactly where he lives in Spain. As we go along, please feel free to pop your questions into the chat box, into the q and I mean, Q&A box, and we will do our best to answer them either behind the scenes, typing our answer out, or we'll try and answer them live as we're talking. So I'm going to go over to Luke first, and Luke is going to talk a little bit about some of the species that we're seeing and where you can see them. Luke. Yeah, cool. Yeah, brilliant. Um, yeah, thanks, Jamie. And um, yeah, great to see so many people uh, joining us on a very, very wet uh, Monday afternoon. Maybe it's raining where you are, pouring down here. Uh, right, let me just do a little bit of uh, screen sharing one second so that... Uh, it all there we go Jamie can hopefully uh, vouch for that popping up all good all good excellent right well off we go um yeah so uh yeah I'm Luke um and uh, I get the pleasure of working uh on the RSPB magazine which is this magazine in, in front of you here um and um in fact this feature was a, a real fascinating one that sort of unfolded before our very eyes because we we plan our magazines uh you know it takes a few months to bring them to you know, fruition and and get them uh, delivered out to all of our members. Um, so at the time when we thought of this idea, we were kind of looking at the situation in Spain being incredibly dry. So this was back in, we were planning this sort of in March, April time. Um, things were very dry and looking quite extreme down in Spain. Uh, and we were sort of wondering on the impacts of, you know, the birds that often arrive there at that time of year. And we were going to look into the, sort of the future. But um, how things have panned out this spring uh, have been really unprecedented. It's absolutely record breaking. And I'll talk about some of the numbers in a, in a little while uh, and obviously some of the species. Um, but yeah, just kind of wanted to set that out initially, how kind of unprecedented this spring has been. It's been absolutely remarkable. So that's a, a black crown night heron on the on the front cover. Um, not a species I ever thought I'd see on the front cover of the RSPB magazine. But there we go. We're, we're sort of making history. Um, but more on that species in a little bit. The first one um, I really want to kind of cover, though, um, and, you know, I think so these species, you know, against the backdrop of, you know, the, the sort of climate change and the, the, you know, the situation in Spain and across Europe and all that sort of thing, these birds are sort of turning up under sort of rather dubious circumstances. But, you know, just for time being, we have to say how fantastic this species actually is. It's, it's really remarkable. Um, this is the, uh, the black wing stilt and uh, no you know, no prizes for guessing kind of where the name comes from. Uh, it's got black wings and those legs are simply incredible. So this bird actually holds a world record, um, not this particular individual bird, but the species, um, but uh, they have the longest legs relative to the, the size of their body. Uh, and they're in the uh, the old Guinness uh, book of records for that. So a bit of an achievement. Um, but when, you know, you read in your field guides about a bird being sort of unmistakable, um, that really is the black wing stilt. Um, now, this particular bird uh, was photographed at uh, Frampton Marsh. Um, these birds have turned up at RSVB reserves across the country. This all started back in April, um, and I managed to see uh, some at, um, uh, in fact, I saw this, this very pair 
um, at RSPB Lodsmore in Dorset. Um, so I'm down on the south coast in Dorset, so it's just up the road from me. So I popped across to, to check out uh, this pair, which were showing well spectacularly well. Um, I got views not too dissimilar from this uh, amazing picture from John Wall here. Um, but they really showed up all over the place. Um, RSPB reserves in particular they chose, uh, they arrived at Old Moor, St. Aidan's, uh, Marazine Marsh in Cornwall, Braiding Marshes on the Isle of Wight, uh, Otmore in the middle of Oxfordshire, you know, that's pretty much as far away from the coast as you can possibly get. Um, and if you read um, Ar uh, Adam Marrick, uh, uh, the feature in the magazine, uh, you would have read that they turned up at Dungeness as well. Um, but they turned up a whole range of other sort of uh, non-RSPB nature reserves as well, um, you know, right up into the far north of Scotland, uh, across Wales, Ireland had quite a lot as well. Um, absolutely amazing. So, you know, when all these birds turn up in the spring, you start to speculate and think, oh, are they going to breed? Um, this is a bird that has been showing signs over the last decade of starting to colonise. Um, and going back, uh, I think 2017 stood out as a quite a big year for this species with chicks fledging across a number of sites, particularly in the southeast of England. Um, but this year, um, with all those kind of record numbers, naturally, we were expecting a few to breed. Um, and if you've been keeping a really close eye on the news, uh, reading your notes on Nature email, um, and it does mention it in the magazine, it's sort of the news emerged just as we went to print. Um, something very exciting happened at RSPB Frampton Marsh. And here's a little video uh, to show you what went on there. So this is, uh, look closely, so this, is, this is actually Dad. Um, so the male blackwing stilts um, have really black, glossy backs. Um, seemingly, my, my field guide, I've got a Collins bird guide, and it says about males having less, um, having, yeah, more black on the head. Um, but actually, in all the birds, um, I've seen the photograph before, the males have less. So contradicting, contradicting the, the book there. But you can see there's uh, a few very small, very fluffy and very long legged little uh, black wing stilt chicks. And there's mum coming in. So mum's got that browner sort of back that I mentioned, uh, the male's very glossy black, um, females are a bit browner. But four chicks there, there's dad again across the front. Um, but really, really exciting. Um, so this is the first time they've ever bred uh, in Lincolnshire. This is, uh, like I say, RSPB Frampton Marsh. And these birds are still there at the moment. Um, two pairs actually nested. Um, and you can see up to 10 birds um, there at the moment. It's, um, it's quite a place to, uh, to be. Um, also, there's a, there's a bird shown really well at um, Slimbridge, which is a wetland and wildfowl trust reserve uh, in Gloucestershire. So if you're not far from there, that's another place you can see them. But Frampton really is where it's happening at the moment. But, um, but a great unmistakable species. Right, on to something uh, a bit different. So blackwing stilts, very easy to see. They wander around in the open uh, and they're very unmistakable. Um, a bird that is, you'd think would be pretty hard to miss is this one. Uh, this is the purple heron, um, about roughly the same size as our gray heron, um, but obviously the colors are a little bit different there. This picture is absolutely superb. Um, you can really see why the name purple heron comes into it with those colors, particularly on its back and sort of through the neck. Um, they've got really long sort of yeah really long sort of snake-like necks um, again very unmistakable um, but I saw my first one of these probably about oh, I don't know seven or eight years ago at um, Radipole Lake in Dorset uh, and it took me about half a day to see the blinking thing um, it, these have a habit of spending a lot of time really really deep in reed beds um, so yeah very hard to see them but um, if you do get to see one here's some of the differences to to look out for um, so like I mentioned, they are roughly the same size as the grey heron, um, tad smaller maybe. Um, the neck is thinner, um, whoever il uh, illustrated this one had to kind of wind its neck in a little bit because it was just too long and wouldn't have fitted on the screen. Um, but if it did stick its neck out, it is notably longer than the grey heron. Um, but you know, it's a, it's a bird actually that, like I said, it's very elusive um, and one that started to show up in quite big numbers. Um, so, you know, I've seen lots of these in Spain um, and they need vast wetlands to, to be able to feed. Obviously, those wetlands have been effectively drying up. So naturally, they were going to turn up here. Um, but so far this summer, we haven't actually seen any sort of breeding, which is interesting. Um, the birds did breed. Um, they have bred in the past at uh, Dungeness uh, down in Kent. 
which is an RSPB reserve. I think it's actually the oldest RSPB reserve. Um, it's over 100 years old now, I think. Um, but yeah, so this is a bird. We might hear some news as the sort of summer emerges. Um, but at the moment, not actually one we think is bred, but certainly one to watch in the future. Um, almost certainly going to start to colonise. Um, so I mentioned records uh, or record breaking springs. And this particular bird, um, yeah, broke all the records. Uh, so this is the black crowned night heron. Um, I'm going to call it night heron from here on in because it's quite a mouthful to say that every time. Um, but um, yeah, absolutely amazing numbers of this bird. Um, they turned up in flocks, in fact, in Ireland. Um, and there's been multiples elsewhere, you know, not far from me in Dorset on the River Stour. I think there was definitely two, maybe even three birds. Um, and, you know, they were right up and down the country. So this is quite a small heron. Um, a little, you know, a lot smaller than the grey heron. I'll show you a picture in just a second to show how small. Um, but from an identification point of view, you know, not too dissimilar from blackwing still in the fact that it's pretty unmistakable. Um, you know, the black, black crown, black back, uh, yellow legs, real sort of beady red eye, quite distinctive, and they're very hunched up as well um, in their sort of stance. But um, but then the, the clue is in the name in terms of how to see these birds. They they're more active at dusk. Um, and they, they actually uh, feed through the night, uh, hence the name night heron. So lots of the views that you'll get of this species in the daytime will be them kind of just roosting up in a tree somewhere. Um, and here's uh, a picture from uh, RSPB Hamwall. Uh, John Crispin, one of the volunteers there, took this picture and uh, shows um, quite the difference between the grey heron there, an awful lot smaller, but showing the kind of distinctive black back and black crown there. So, um, yeah, um, so that's one of the, that was probably the standout from this spring in terms of uh, records and species turning up. So from the magazine, we've just kind of um, taken this little, uh, little sort of, graph, or sort of graphic out of there, um, just to give you sort of an idea of the sort of numbers. Um, so this only goes up until uh, middle of May. Um, so we have to thank uh, Chris Batty from Rare Bird Alert for sending us the, these stats. Um, so up until the 10th of May. But already that, at that point, we'd seen record numbers of the Blackwing stilts. Um, and we, we'd already seen record numbers of night herons. Um, now, numbers have potentially gone up. It all gets a little bit confusing once the birds are in the country. They start to move around a lot and, uh, you know, it gets very confusing. And yeah, but basically, um, breeding wise, um, again, similar to the purple heron, we don't really know the picture yet. Um, they did breed in 2017, which was the first, uh, the first time uh, in Britain, and that was on the Somerset levels. Um, but nobody knew that they were breeding, basically, until it had all happened, and suddenly a pair uh, turned up in a tree with two youngsters. Um, so they're incredibly secretive and I, I'd be watching the news really carefully over the next few weeks in the bird world and uh, I, I, I put money on the fact that this species must have bred in Britain this year. Um, so again, could be start of, of colonising. Um, now there's one more bird on that chart, the, the glossy ibis. Um, and it's an it's quite an interesting species and there's a few species that fall into a sort of wider category. So this spring we've seen sort of a real knee jerk reaction to the, the, the situation in Spain, which is, you know, like we've mentioned, it, it's been really dry and really dire. Um, but over the past decade or more, we've seen kind of birds starting to colonize and generally move further north as well, sort of gradually. And glossy ibis is, is one of those species. Um, there's two here sitting on a, on a on a perch. This is from uh, uh, RSPB Hamwall again in Somerset. Um, and this pair has been hanging around for a few years, um, but they're yet to breed for some reason. They're just hanging around. Um, they get on very well. They're always together. And, um, you know, they've been displaying all sorts of things, but, you know, they've, they've yet to breed, which is interesting. Um, but David Lindo later on in, the, in his interview with Jamie um, sort of expands on the reasons and the story behind Glossy Ibis, which is, which is fascinating. Um, another species, though, is the cattle egret. And this is a, a flock of cattle egrets. Um, you can see they've got their yellow beaks as opposed to the black beak of the little egret. Um, cattle egrets a little bit smaller as well, a bit more hunched up um, in their sort of posture. Um, but just 
oh, was it last week, actually, just down about 10 miles from me, a flock of 50 showed up uh, of Cat Legret. Um, and the Somerset levels, you know, there's been numbers up to sort of 300 plus, uh, and they're breeding along the south coast now as well, for sure. Um, and they're starting to push further north as well. So this has been a real gradual thing that started to happen. Um, same goes for the, the great egret as well, um, or great white egret, um, which is basically, you know, as big, if not slightly taller than the grey heron, so a very big, tall bird, uh, all white with a big old yellow beak. Um, but this is another bird that's been gradually colonising. And uh, when we started planning the, the feature in the magazine, uh, like I said, back in March, uh, we gathered up at RSBB Leighton Moss, uh, which is in uh, Lancashire, uh, right up in the north. And um, we had a walk around the reserve and we saw great white egret that far up as well. So it's a bird that we're all starting to become much more familiar with uh, in our bird watching. So um, yeah, a fascinating picture to see what's emerging. But um, but just to finish, just to recap on well, no, that first species I talked about at length there, the, the, the black wing stilt. Um, this is that stunning pair from RSPB Lodmore again in Dorset. Um, but, you know, as gorgeous and as stunning as they are, um, they are a little bit of a red flag. And uh, that's a good time for me to um, pass on to um, somebody else. And <laughs> whilst I figure out to stop sharing my screen, there we go. Thank you very much, Luke. Um, and we've had a few interesting questions come in, which we will return to after the next little talk. Um, and that was really, really interesting. And I would, would just say at this point, if you'd like to support our work creating, restoring and managing those habitats for nature, a bit like some of the nature reserves Luke's been talking about, we're going to pop a link and a QR code in the chat now. Uh, so there'll be a QR code you can scan if you've got a smartphone on you. And we'll also put a link into the webinar chat. Um, and then we'll repeat that at the end as well, if you missed it. So as Luke mentioned at the end here, um, there are problems. So this is great that we're seeing these amazing birds like the glossy ibis that you can see on the screen at the moment and those amazing looking black wing stilts. But it's a signal. It's a signal to us that something isn't quite right. And we're going to take a look now at one of the uh, causes for these kind of changes in birds locations and movements with Katie Monk. Now Katie's on our youth council and she's going to tell us a little bit about the situation with the climate crisis. Katie, over to you. Oh. There we go, sorry, I think my video was blocked there. Um, yeah, hi everyone, um, I'm Katie. I'll just try and share my screen. I've been um, a member of the RSV Youth Council for a couple of years now, um, and we just want to get a voice, a young voice, um, inputting into the actual RSPB. Um, I think that should be showing. Okay. Is that okay? All good. Cool. Perfect. Yeah, so I've always had a particular interest in wetland birds across the UK and Europe, and I've been lucky enough to go to these places and see these remarkable birds for myself. Um, but today I'm going to explore a bit more about what is affecting these birds, the expected climate changes we're likely to see, how they might impact our wetland sites and how the RSPB is responding. So I think we all know by now that future temperatures are expected to rise exponentially in the next few years, at least 1.5 degrees of warming, and that has really catastrophic impacts on the planet and its ecosystems. And the obvious impacts are widely publicised. So we have the great coral reefs bleaching, the melting of ice, the decrease in polar bears, the drowning cities and islands. But a lesser known impact of that is the effects of global warming and climate change on bird populations, even in the UK. As I'm sure you're all aware, there's been an increase in the intensity and frequency of extreme weather events, including these prolonged droughts from shifting precipitation patterns, leading to a larger number of wildfires. Most recently, there's been wildfires across southern Europe, but closer to home, there was also a devastating wildfire on RSPB Coromony, which is a RSPB reserve up in Scotland. And as well as this, rising temperatures can lead to increased evaporation, which can result in heavier rainfall and elevated flood risks, with warmer oceans fueling higher intensity tropical storms. We are also witnessing rising sea levels with increased erosion, posing challenges for coastal areas, including biodiverse habitats situated on the coast, like RSPB Minsmere. The effects of these changes are not only environmental, but also have so many implications on societies and livelihoods, and this endangers human health, agriculture, infrastructure, as well as impacting species and disrupting ecosystems. So all these intertidal wetland habitats in the UK provide essential support for really significant numbers of waterfowl and waders. 
These habitats are mainly found in estuaries and sheltered coastal areas and are comprised of salt marshes and mudflats, providing breeding grounds and stopover sites for really globally important bird populations. Now a quarter of the bird species listed on the Birds of Conservation Concern Red List and over half of the amber listed species use coastal habitats in various stages of their life cycle, including birds like this red shank, little tern, oyster catcher, curlew, and many others relying on these areas for stopovers and feeding. But we also have these more exotic birds like the purple heron, the glossy ibis, the black crowned night heron turning up occasionally. So these existence of a network of suitable wetland sites is so pivotal for them to rest and feed and is crucial for some of these birds to survive throughout their migration journeys. Unfortunately though, the UK's coastal habitats are under threat with significant losses of salt marsh habitat due to erosion, agriculture and development. So the current rates of restoration of salt marsh habitat, which the RSVB is really working hard to do, have been found to be insufficient to keep up with the losses caused by sea level rise and all these other pressures. And we've lost more than 15% of UK salt marsh habitat between 1945 and 2010 and projected to about 4.5% in the next 10, 10 years or so. And there's a, there's a projection as well that we will have lost more than 5,980 hectares by 2100, which I worked out to be almost the equivalent of 74,000 football fields. So I'm now just going to run through the three particular ways that wetland habitats are under threat. So basically, wetland habitats are particularly vulnerable to climate change due to their sensitivity to various environmental factors. So one reason is that changing weather patterns such as more frequent and intense heat waves, droughts and heavy rainfall can disrupt the delicate balance of these ecosystems. Even though wetlands are supposed to be wet, they're not supposed to be that wet. So these extreme weather events and heavy downpours can cause flooding, which will overwhelm wetland ecosystems and disrupt their natural functions. So the floods can submerge nesting islands of really important bird species and destroy marginal vegetation for feeding. Rising sea levels can also pose a significant threat to wetlands, especially coastal wetlands, which leads to increased erosion and the gradual loss of land and biodiverse habitat. This isn't exactly helped by the recent colonisation of the Chinese mitten crabs, when around 1945 they make clung to the underside of ships and made their way across the UK from Eastern Asia. They are carried during floods, um, which is spread when they're spread to different wetland areas. And so with climate change, the more floods that we get, the more of these invasive species we'll have. So they then burrow into the banks of wetland habitat in dense populations, which cause further erosion and decrease the biodiverse habitat. So the combined effect of these climate change impacts makes wetlands at high risk, necessitating urgent conservation efforts to protect these vital habitats and all the diverse species they support. So I'm going to move away from wetlands a little bit and talk about how climate change has caused an impact on the movement of migrating birds, whether it's to wetlands or different areas. Normally, their movements align with the availability of the primary food sources and the hatching of chicks. However, unpredictable weather patterns caused by climate change have thrown these key timings completely off balance. And as a result, these birds may alter their local migrations which, and seek better habitats or different food sources. During their migration as well, wetland birds may encounter unseasonably bad weather, leading to setbacks in their journey and potentially missing the peak emergence of their food sources, which can lead to fatalities. Even non-migratory birds like flamingos, which we'll hear a bit more about later in David Lindo's film, are affected by climate related changes in their breeding areas and have to relocate to find suitable habitat as their wet wetlands habitat have become dry and you can't exactly have a wetland without water. So it's not all doom and gloom. I don't want to make this whole talk about all the bad stuff that's happening in the UK, because as much as intertidal hat areas provide biodiverse habitats, they also provide accessible spaces for people to enjoy wildlife, as well as improving coastal water quality by absorbing pollutants before they reach the sea, which has all kinds of benefits for marine habitats and species. They are also really instrumental in mitigating climate change through their remarkable carbon sequestration abilities, much like the rainforest or the massive kelp forests we have around the UK. So they efficiently capture and store substantial amounts of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere in their dense vegetation and marshy soils, which help to reduce atmospheric CO2 levels and contribute to long-term carbon storage. 
Preserving and restoring these habitats is really critical for climate change mitigation efforts. So moving on from the biodiversity part, coastal communities in the UK are also facing increasing flooding risks due to erosion, storm surges and rising sea levels. Intertidal wetland habitats act as natural buffers which reduce the risk of coastal flooding and protect these communities. So projects like RSB Medmary shown on this screen, which was Europe's largest coastal realignment project when it was opened in 2013. There was Wallasey Island and also Skin Flats, and they show how we can extend mud flats and salt marshes in front of the sea walls as part of coastal realignment and make them stronger by using this practice just by moving the coast around. So by using these salt marshes as natural defences, we can lower wave heights by about 20%, reducing the need for costly flood defences and lessening the risk of extreme flooding. So by preserving and creating these habitats is really vital for the environment, wildlife, and all these coastal communities, saving them from climate-induced floods. So by safeguarding these valuable ecosystems, it's really essential to focus on protecting, creating and restoring all these intertidal habitats and recognise both the significance for both nature and people. I'm just going to stop showing my screen now. Well, thank you very much, Katie. Um, the good news, good news and bad news in that one. Um, just going back to the, the bad news for a second. So we've got that got that covered you you talked about lots of different effects that the changing climate is having on birds and and the other one the, the kind of opposite end to birds moving up from europe into the uk is we're getting birds in the more northerly parts of the uk that rely on cooler temperatures or um the the food that comes with those temperatures are being pushed up aren't they so if we think about things like um species in mountains ptarmigan uh, snow buns things could be affected yes there's this massive climate squeeze almost so it's, all, it's almost like the polar bear situation in the Arctic. So all this habitat is disappearing and they're just being pushed further and further south or as in the case for birds in, south, in the Southern Europe and things, they're being pushed further and further north into these habitats in the UK. And whether they'll be able to survive or not is really just based on how well they adapt. Because obviously the UK doesn't have the same temperatures as say Southern Spain does. We don't have these exotic looking forests. We don't have all these exotic temperatures. So yeah, it's really up to us to create these habitats which they can find their niche in because otherwise this squeeze is just going to completely wipe out bird populations. It's very worrying and, and that just does just remind me one, one question I was going to throw over to you is the species that we've we've been talking about today um the glossy ibis the stilts etc are they here all year round or will they you know follow sort of migratory routes back down into Europe and Africa? Um, yeah, so basically a lot of the birds that turned up this spring, the reason they, they arrived was, was around the fact that they'd already migrated to, to Spain, uh, found that the situation there was basically not to the like, and the habitat in some cases just wasn't there. So they have to then carry on their migration much further north than normal, and obviously that's how they got here. So they are mainly migratory species, so the, the night heron, uh, the, the stilts, uh, the purple herons, you know, they are kind of spring migrants um, and anyone that are in the country at the moment are going to head back south so um, but there, there are other species like the glossy ibis and you know like the cattle egret um, that basically are sort of starting to become a bit of a year-round feature um, so so interestingly glossy ibis you know you go back a few decades and you know the odd one might have shown up occasionally but they wouldn't have been able to spend the winter same goes for cattle egret um, historically you know they wouldn't have coped with you know prolonged cold spells in winter they, they're not sort of that adaptable they, they need to feed um you know if the ground is solid for too long then they they don't sort of survive but but nowadays because there's so many of them um they can sort of you know they're a bit more resistant to short cold spells but um but yeah it's, it's quite a mix of picture so um yeah so this autumn you know you might see something like the you know any remaining black wing stilts can be moving back south so you know if you've got a wetland near you then you know they might well show up again so you might have another second chance to see them um same goes for night heron um you know and they could literally turn up almost anywhere um some of them have even been really urban as well um you know sort of on like little rivers that run through the middle of towns and canals and things like that so um but yeah yeah fascinating stuff so great white egrets so we had a question in from carol which which you've answered which is basically um with the new birds visit in the uk are they being ringed to trap their journeys? And, and perhaps you could share what we were, what you were saying about the, the great white egrets. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so ringing is a, is a you know it's a useful 
uh, sort of tool in the sort of conservation sort of armory really of uh, so it, if anybody who's not familiar so it's a, it's a process of adding a, a small little tag to, to a bird's leg and it's got a unique number which means that that bird is identifiable as an individual which then offers a, you know lots of insight into its into its life where it goes and how how old how old it is and stuff like that um so most of the species that turn up um they're not ringed because basically you can't catch them to ring them so um they're very very tricky to to get hold of um things like the black wing stilts because this is a colonizing species this is a bird that's you know it's genuinely starting to establish itself in britain so it's in quite a sensitive time of its kind of development in the UK, um, I think they're actually sort of amber listed. And that just kind of reflects the fact that, you know, we need to kind of keep an eye on the species because it's it's colonizing. So that the chicks, you know, you could have, could, you know, they could have been ringed, I guess, but that means going in and, and some element of disturbance. And, and at the moment, you know, the birds just need to kind of focus on getting established. But um, but the great white egrets, you know, they're in quite big numbers now, especially in Somerset. Um, they're up into sort of their dozens, I believe now. Um, and this year sounds like another brilliant year. I was talking to the site manager there uh, a few days ago, um, and he said they're having a, a brilliant year again at, at Hamwall. And um, yeah, so they've been adding, uh, they, they find the nests with drones. So they fly a drone over the reed bed. And because they're big white birds, they're easy to see. Um, so that's how they count all the nests. And then they go in very carefully and uh, add little red, red rings to the bird's legs. Um, and uh, yeah, so far they're, they're, they're shooting off all, all around the country. So it's just showing how quickly this bird kind of could colonize, you know, a wetland, you know, literally any, anywhere near, near any of us. Um, and they've been flying all the way. As far, yeah, some of them have been recorded in Scotland and Wales and, and obviously some head back sort of to Dorset as well. I've seen one near me with a red ring on it, which was from Hamwall. So uh, yeah. Let's talk about Hamwall though, because Hamwall, we often talk about at the RSPB as the heron capital of the UK. Let, let's talk about why that is, because there's several heron species now that you can find there, aren't there? Yeah, yeah. So I think it's um, uh, seven species, um, which is which is remarkable. Um, you know, I think there's seven species now that's potentially bred across the Somerset levels. Um, and basically they're, they're turning up there because the habitat is just perfect. Um, you know, what, what's happening in Somerset is, is a perfect example of conservation. Um, so there's, there's a whole range of landowners uh, all coming together to create, you know, what is effectively a landscape scale sort of nature reserve. Um, so I mentioned Hamwall in particular, that's kind of sort of quite central in the Somerset level sort of complex, the Avalon Marshes, I think it's called. Um, but then you've got Shapwick Heath just over the road, which is Natural England's reserve. And then another mile away is West Hay, which is a wildlife trust reserve um, and, and lots of other sort of reserves all sort of joined up. Um, and Bittens were, were the kind of reason Hamwall kind of came to fruition. Um, it was a reserve created pretty much from scratch. So there was an area of land that um, there's a lot of peat extraction formerly on the Somerset levels. Um, and basically that land was just perfect to be flooded. And then RSPB was kind of buying up patches and planting reeds. There was actually people out putting reeds in by hand to establish the reed beds. Um, but it was on the basis of sound science off the back of bitten research. So finding out that actually, you know, bittens don't like massive, huge reed beds, actually. Um, what, be, what bittens need is um, reed edge where they like to fish. So and it's all about the amount of food available as well. So just kind of creating that perfect habitat. But it just so happens that um, it's right for a whole range of other heron species as well. Um, and actually, I, I do. Um, let me share this quickly, um, just because it's. It's a great picture. Uh, so John, John, John Crispin, whose pictures were in the um, uh, in the in the little talk I did earlier on, um, he's a great photographer. He's there almost every day at Hamwall. And this is a male little bitten that he photographed a number of years ago. Um, but yeah, little bittens are one of the species we haven't talked about at all yet. Um, I thought there were going to be a little influx this year. Um, doesn't seem so, but these are amazingly elusive birds. Um, but the size of a moorhen is quite small um, and um, yeah, very, very difficult to see. Um, I've only ever seen one very, very briefly after a very long wait, um, but good to, good excuse to share uh, John's picture okay. there of, uh, of a little bitten. But, um, but yeah, but that's, that's another species to keep an eye on, you know, constantly all these changes are evolving and species are showing up all over the place. They really are. Let's, let's get back to Katie now, because Katie, we've had an interesting question in about, um, managing this kind of message of joy <laughs> so obviously you know we're happy to see these birds but how do you kind of manage that message with the the the, the looming disaster that the sort of climate crisis presents us 
Yeah, I think when you see all these really exotic birds turning up, there is the slight worry that they're not supposed to be here. And I think it's kind of balancing it because you see these birds and then so many more people want to see these birds because they're all colourful and pretty and that's what gets everyone into these nature reserves and stuff. And I think as more people become engaged with that, there's going to be more awareness around all the different detrimental things that are happening at the moment and when you have more people then more action can be taken you have all these big marches going on big campaigns and I think as more and more people get involved there'll be more and more action that's actually happening so it's it kind of it goes one way in the other and I think you see all these community actions being taken as well I think when you actually get involved with people and you see other people are also like minds of what is actually happening. It's it's quite bad, actually. And meeting other people like that, there is, you know, there is other people like that. And it kind of uplifts your spirits a bit because you're not the only one that's fighting this. You know, you're in a whole group, really. It makes a huge difference. And and, and going back, we're talking about bad news in, in that we're talking about. The, the, the good news, while you were talking about... Um, how wetlands can actually be part of the solution so not only can they be great places for nature and people they also have that kind of impact on on climate don't they so what you were saying about medmary and wallacey they can actually yeah. have a make a positive difference the more that we enhance and build put back these wetlands exactly if you restore these wetlands you're gonna help mitigate climate change it's 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 two sides of the same coin like if you want to mitigate climate change make more wetlands you get more wildlife then as well and i think government really needs to realize this that we need to restore more nature to actually fight this thing that's happening. Um, nature is part ways. of the solution. Yeah, exactly. Nature-based um, solutions. Now we've had a few questions in about bird flu. I don't know which one of you wants to take this, but basically people are asking: um, Are you know are these these new birds that are moving in? Is is is, is bird flu a, is bird flu a threat to them? And how you know? It, I, generally asking about bird flu in general. What what kind of impacts would that be having on on bird populations? With, with that kind of link with climate change and new birds moving in any any thoughts on that yeah i mean i i can i can chip in yeah i mean it's yeah bird flu so in particular with the birds we've been talking about you know the species we've been highlighting um they're probably not impacted as badly as other species so the species that uh are sort of really you know it's been a disaster for a species that nest in really tight colonies um so i mean it, it's it's horrible at the second if you look all across the social media and things and seeing the situation with um, you know turns so um, not far from me you know there's there's turn colonies that you know just just a hundred plus sandwich turns kind of dead unfortunately you know through through bird flu lots of chicks not survived um, they all nest in very close proximity um, and that's really not good um you know roseate turns of a coca island you know they're our rarest seabird in britain um, and they've been really decimated by it so you know, it, it's it's going to have huge impacts over the next, you know, it's going to be a long time before these birds kind of recover. But, you know, but climate change only makes this thing, you know, even harder. So lots of our birds are already under pressure. You know, we're, we're at the moment we're fighting for, you know, sand eel fishing bans in the North Sea, uh, for instance, to try and help our seabirds find more food. You know, they're, they're already struggling. So when you add in something like bird flu, which, you know, it's a disease that's developed from the poultry industry. Don't forget, this isn't actually just a natural disease that sort of floats around in, in ecosystems. This is something that humans have kind of created. Um, so, you know, you introduce that into the into the scenario with all the other pressures. And it really isn't good. It, it's it's a really bleak picture. And, and unfortunately, you know, there's, there's not an awful lot people can do about it really I mean we're really trying hard as an organization to you know get out there and and monitor and build that sort of resilience for those species and that's why you know banning sand eel fishing they'll see is one meaningful thing actually that you know the government can do and RSV will keep pushing for that as hard as we can and absolutely now we, we will actually be returning to seabirds next week so if anyone yeah, wants to point. sign up we, we, we have got a webinar on seabirds and on this very topic next Monday so we'll be sharing the link at the end of this session um, and it'll be a celebration of seabirds, but we're also going to be looking at some of the threats they face, climate change included. And um, we'll take a little break now because we're all going to watch um, this chat with David Lindo. Now, David is better known as the urban birder. He's been uh, a broadcaster, writer for many years, bird, keen bird watcher. Um, but he's been recently living in Spain. So I think he's been in there for been there for about seven or eight years. So he's in the perfect place now to have witnessed some of the changes to wetland bird life that we've been thinking about. 
I caught up with David a few weeks ago to talk about some of the birds that we've been discussing today and the changes that we're seeing. Yeah, um, I'm, uh, by the way, Jamie, thank you very much for having me. Um, I live in Extremadura, which is in southwest Spain, uh, a region that borders uh, Portugal to the west and to the south, you've got Andalusia, and to the north, you've got everywhere else, including Madrid. So um, we're kind of in the southwest middle of Spain and it's landlocked. Um, and the species you mentioned, I see on a regular basis. Um, interestingly, the, it's the glossy ibis, uh, which has increased quite phenomenally here. Because I remember when I first started going to Iberia on a regular basis, which was probably about what, 12, 13 years now ago, um, I remember going to Portugal and the Tagus estuary, um, or Tagus, which is um, right next door to Lisbon, beautiful area, which is under threat, because um, I, I know they were trying to build an airport there. But the autumn winter numbers of greater flamingos and glossy ibis were just mind blowing. You look up and there'd be a cloud of black and pink, you know, both birds flying together. Um, but further inland, um, because I'm kind of directly east of Lisbon by two and a half hours or three hours driving, um, I remember seeing not that many. There wasn't clouds of, uh, of of glossy ibis actually around in the wetland areas around in Extremadura. But over the last 10 years, it's really increased uh, the species. I mean, I lived in a, a city called Merida, which is the capital city of the region. I mean, capital, 60,000 people, but huge village. But And it, in between or in the actual um, city runs a river called the Guadiana, and I used to see them on that river. But then since lockdown, or maybe just before, but certainly since lockdown, the numbers have increased and partially down to the crayfish, the American signal crayfish that has proliferated. And I suppose in response to glossy ibis have realized that they've had a good food source and they've they started sort of feeding on them and now they, they nest within the city. Um, and I never saw them those species at all in the UK. I mean, glossy ibis, I remember breaking my neck to go to Stodmarsh um, to to see uh, a glossy ibis back in the in the 90s, you know, as a major deal. Um, so, and then I, I remember even back then people were talking, oh, are they, are they actually European birds or could they be American birds heading up? But we now know they're European birds. So yeah, there's been a marked increase in glossy ibis, but all the other species I, I see on a very regular basis. I mean, extra Majuda as a region has suffered many droughts. I mean, during the time I've been here, there was one time when it, it didn't rain for 18 months. Um, and the the landscape habitually is, is is blonde during the summer anyway, as part of the, the thing here. But it actually is getting worse with the, the change in the climate. So I just think these birds have actually done very well, given that they've got a great and abundant food source and have naturally started spreading north. Really interesting. And uh, and you, you mentioned that they're becoming more sort of city dwellers as well. So you're more likely to see a glossy ibis within a sort of urban setting. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I see them most of the time actually within urban areas. Um, and by that, I'm talking about along the edge of rivers or in, in, in Merida, for example, the great thing about Merida is that the river, a lot of the banks are just natural uh, and marshy as well. So you get birds, you know, in in channels and stuff all the time. Um, so that's that's really nice to see. But there's other other wetland birds I've noticed increasing as well. Or I see them much more, um, you know, ranging from Chetty's warblers through to purple heron and stuff. I'm seeing a lot of them um, when I'm in this region. I mean, there's an area just just outside Merida uh, where I visit. It's a reservoir. And basically, you know, this this reservoir is uh, dissected by a road, a major road, not that there's loads of traffic on it, but it's a major road, either side as a reed bed. And I remember standing along this road, major road and counting maybe 10 or 15 individual purple herons during the breeding season, you know, and this area isn't a vast area of reed bed. So they seem to be doing quite well again. So maybe, you know, overspill birds moving further north could be the could be the reason why we're getting a, a few more 
in the UK. Not that I've ever seen a purple heron in the UK before. There has been changes. Um, one of the major habitats um, that supports not only the, uh, the glossy ibis and storks, but also lots of passage waders are the rice fields. And uh, they are a real source of, of great food for birds, but also a good place to watch birds as well. Um, the problem is, I mean, there's quite a few rice fields over in the Tagus estuary by Lisbon, which is great, but I think even they are beginning to be drained. But certainly in Extra Majuda, there's less of them now. Um, and that's due to the fact that um, I guess the, 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 the areas of land that are used as um, rice fields are, are kind of family owned. It's not as if one person owns a massive swathe of land, it's just plots basically. And people are beginning to think to themselves, you know what, maybe I should be growing fruit instead, or maybe I should make this into an olive grove. So they've, they started draining their plots and making them into these monocultures, which is a real shame. I mean, in Extra Maduda, there's one particular area, um, because it's, again, it's not too far from Medida, uh, where it's just mile after mile after mile after mile of, of rice fields. I mean, you can drive the whole area and it's at least 40 kilometers long um, of discont you know, basically contiguous um, fields. But then over the years, more and more of them have been turned over to fruit farming or, or, or for olive groves. Um, so you're finding less and less of those spots that are really good wetland areas. And this is, I remember when I first showed up and started exploring these areas, I was thinking this would be an amazing nature reserve. This, if this was in England or Britain, it will be totally a nature reserve straight away, you know, because it's just a great habitat. And it's a happy accident because the, the farmers, the rice field farmers, they don't, they don't really know um, how, how productive this place is. They don't, they're just following what they normally do, which is, you know, they plant in May, or they sow the land in May, they irrigate it, and come November, they harvest it, leaving these really amazing areas of, of wetland. Um, and then um, earlier, or later in the spring, they start turning the land over, and the tractors are followed by hordes of egrets and, and, uh, and gulls. For them, they're just doing their thing, but in reality, it kind of works perfectly with the migration cycles because the shorebirds come just as the land is really at its prime in terms of being like a wetland, and you can go there. I remember one time I saw a field, and it had over 400, in fact, 401 rough in a tiny field, all kind of feeding busily. It obviously, just arrived. It was incredible to to see such a thing. So finally, uh, trickiest question of all. What are your predictions? So over the next couple of decades, what do you think? How do you think bird life is going to change in that part of Europe and the UK? Um, well, it's hard to. Well, I mean, there's the obvious prediction, which is a lot of the the birds that you know that we associated with the Mediterranean, like little egret, um, Chetty's warbler, have all kind of moved north. Um, in response to changes in climate, it's all becoming much more hospitable for them. I mean, black wing stilts, you know, much more of a, a thing now in the UK. Um, so I think that will continue. But then there's some birds that kind of buck the trend a little bit or don't react or don't actually do what we predict. I mean, even though cattle egrets are now beginning to have a bit of a toehold in the UK, it's been taking a long time. And I thought out of all of them, the cattle egret would be the first in. You know, because I've seen cattle egrets all over the world. They seem to sort of invade everywhere. But for some reason, they seem to have been pretty slow in the UK until recently. So my view in the future is that, you know, we will get more of those um, birds heading north. Um, I reckon that we'll probably get things like great reed warblers actually properly breeding for the first time. And maybe a few others um, who are a, a sort of tied of aquatic um, areas. Maybe we'll, we might get more blue throats wintering um, in the UK because they winter in um, in, in Spain, next time I do that, in, in marshy wetland areas. So I can imagine that can, can be a thing happening in the future. In Spain, I think that, you know, things will carry on as was. There seems, I think a few more birds from North Africa will be moving into uh, southern Spain because southern Spain 
really does resemble North Africa sometimes. It really does resemble Morocco. So I could imagine particularly birds that use um, step areas and sort of arid areas like some of the larks and, you know, cream colored corsa perhaps um, may become more prevalent. I mean, as in southern Spain near Tarifa, which is near Gibraltar, you've got things like the occasional trumpeter finch nesting. So I think that they all kind of start moving in from the south. So I think there'll be like a, a gradual, you know, from Africa to, to Spain and from Medi the Mediterranean upwards into northeast Europe and, and Britain. I think that might be a situation that occurs. But my worry is that, you know, we're losing wetlands at a, at a, at a stupid rate. Um, so even though this movement might be great on one level, it may not be the habitat for them. It's great to catch up with David um, and hear some of his views and his predictions there. Really, really interesting. We have got a few more questions that have come in. I'm going to throw one out to uh, Luke and Katie. Uh, this one's from Helen, um, who says, in Ireland, if I see a rarer species of flower or fauna, I record it on biodiversity.ie. How do you record um, species on a UK recording database? Is this something that either of you use? Yeah, don't take it, Katie. I, I I was just going to say my thoughts. Um, I know of many little ones that are mainly for each family. So you've got bird track for birds. You've got the BS by BI, which is like a botanical society. I can't remember the acronym um, for plants. And then I was just looking, there's National Biodiversity Network as well, um, which you can just submit recordings to. And I think there's not like a very, very set in stone recording database in the UK that I know of, but there's one for each little niche of animal okay and which, what, which ones do you use luke i know you use one for moths don't you uh oh yeah that's true well the the, the ones the, the the key ones i use actually a uh, bird track was mentioned by katie which which is a really good so bird track is a is from our from the topic today bird track is probably the best because what happens with that the data goes to uh the the sort of local uh, biodiversity sort of offices offices and they get verified and then the the data all gets collated um uh, but i record is another really good one as well you can record a whole range of species on on i records of insects and butterflies moths and birds um, and again that data it reaches the the sort of national databases um, and then that data gets used for all sorts of great things you know so if for instance a planner wants to build something um you know in a, in a field uh, one of the things they have to do is to go into the the, the biodiversity record centers and get the records for that area to find out what biodiversity is there um and obviously if the records have all been submitted and it's and that data is there then it, it makes these sort of decisions around planning much more informed for you know and considering biodiversity so yeah great to record things and send in data Thank, um, you. Yes. thank you both. there's also the um, big butterfly count going on at the moment oh, which yeah, i think course. ends on the 6th of august um, yes so yeah with save butterflies so i think that's a really good thing to do and you just need a few hours spare really just to go out and record butterflies yeah good point i, I think you can just do it in a 15 minute slot the big butterfly mm -hmm. count can't you so that's a great one to do thank you katie and um, someone called chris has mentioned as well mentioned your count the county recorders for birds as well so um, in the UK, I believe that's UK wide. Um, a county recorder will take a records of, of birds, so you can look those up on the internet. We have lots of other questions, and sadly, we won't be able to work through all of them. Um, I'm just having a quick whistle to see if there's any that we can answer quickly, given the time we've got. I think one one that I think is quite interesting is the impact on uh, species that are currently here of birds that are moving in. Now, I don't imagine that at the moment a glossy ibis or a great white eagle is going to have a huge effect on other species that are currently in our wetlands, is it? Any thoughts from either of you? Yeah, no. So I think I think the, the the key to that one is it's largely habitat based, essentially. Um, mm. You know, lots of these species, you know, are mainly Europe, Europe kind of live together in, in sort of similar habitats. So so, yeah, I, I wouldn't envisage, you know, the, the species we've seen coming in this spring are going to be sort of out competing other, other species. I mean, that can happen, but that tends to happen when they're species that have been sort of accidentally introduced into the wild. So, you know, that's yeah. a whole completely different topic so what we're seeing here is kind of natural sort of colonization of species that you know are not too far away and they coexist in similar habitats to the ones we get now but um but no if the habitat's right and there's plenty of food um then they should all live kind of happily side by side but um but yeah it's largely dependent on, on the habitat and the amount of grub essentially 
and, and that's what we're all aiming to achieve as the RSPB. We're trying to make sure that those places are there and that food supply is there um, and that we're all kind of working towards. Um, we are running out of time, so I'd like to say thank you to all our contributors, Katie, Luke and David. Plus, I'd like to mention Lisa and Claire from the RSPB events team who have been working incredibly hard behind the scenes uh, to make this webinar work. Um, thank you, everyone who's been watching up to about 400 of you, 400 of you at, at one point today. Um, once again, if you'd like to make a donation towards the RS, RSPB's work, maintaining and restoring these habitats put in the back, um, we've got a QR code for you to scan and we'll put a link in the chat. Now, just as you leave today, a survey will pop up as this session ends. Um, there are just five questions, and if you have time to answer them, should only take a few minutes, it will really help us plan more sessions for you to join in the future. Our next webinar will be a celebration of seabirds, and that's at 10.30 a.m. next Monday, 7th of August. And we do hope you can join us then. Thank you, Luke. Thank you, Katie. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.